Dumbarton Castle and Rock. To him who enters Scotland by her western gate, the River Clyde, there rises majestic from its low and level northern bank the cleft basaltic pile of Dumbarton Rock, crowned and willed about with a fortress which, since immemorial time, has been a stronghold of renown. Once its name was Dunbritton, the Britain's Rock, but even before that ancient tribe gave it a name, it was a fortress, the venerable bee tells of the days when it was simply Alclyde, the rock upon the Clyde. In his days it was capital of a kingdom, Strathclyde. Long before this the Roman galleys, patrolling the western waters, creeping timidly out to Ultima Tula, made this their station and winter port, named Theodosia. Then a Roman fort crowned the summit, and bulwarked the end of Antonine's defensive wall. What it was earlier, and what skin robe tribe first held its summit, is and shall be unknown, but certain we may be that it has been a refuge and a strength in this lowland ever since human eyes first beheld it. The rock of Dumbarton is a basalt mass, upthrust by primeval fires through the red sandstone. Thus it resembles Ailsa Craig, the base rock, Stirling Castle Rock and Abbey Craig, its neighbour, and other sharp-featured cliffs throughout South Scotland. 560 feet in height, a mile about its base, it precipitously overhangs the Clyde and the Leven where they join. A deep and narrow cleft bifurcates the rock, giving it the shape of a mitre, the western half, called Wallace's seat, being slightly higher. On it still grows the Scotch thistle, a rare plant in its native country, recalling Ossian's description of Balclutha, as he names the rock, the thistle shakes there its lovely head. The castle of Dumbarton is today a fortification of little account. Since cannon have been employed in warfare it has been commandable by the rocky hill of Dumbuck, a mile away, nevertheless it is still garrisoned and will be while England remains a military power, for it is one of the four fortresses of Scotland appointed, at the Union, to be forever held defensible. The buildings are small, and the ramparts weak. Its frowning guns are ancient smoothbores but it holds a phantasm of domination over the great commercial river, and offers to the eye a picturesque vision of old-time military strength. Of its history much is lost. After the Roman era it was taken as a fortress by the Britons, and was their chief stronghold in the 8th century. In 756 it is said to have been reduced through famine by Egbert of Northumberland. In spite of this tradition, it has ever been esteemed so strong that it has never passed out of the possession of the crown, but has been continuously a royal castle. The town of Dumbarton was the chief seat of the Earls of Lennox, but when Alexander II confirmed Earl Maldwin in his estates early in the 13th century, the castle and some surrounding land were specially reserved, and erected into a free borough royal, with extensive rights to levy dues on Clyde Boehm commerce. At the commencement of the competition for the crown of Scotland between Bruce and Balliol, Dumbarton, with the other royal strongholds, was delivered over to Edward I, and in 1292 was given to Balliol as one of the appurtenances of his crown. In 1296 it was again occupied by the English under the governorship of Alexander de Leeds. In 1305 Sir William Wallace, loaded with chains, was sent from Dumbarton to London, and for the next four years the castle was governed by Sir John Menteith, his alleged betrayer. In 1309 Robert Bruce gained the castle by stratagem, but how is not recorded. We know only that the capture was planned and executed by Oliver, a carpenter, who received for it a grant of lands. Over and over again in the next two hundred years, the castle changed hands, sometimes peacefully, again by treachery or force. At whiles it was besieged in vain, as in 1481 by an English fleet. It was the naval headquarters of Scotland on the west coast, and here was fitted out the little squadron which was uselessly dispatched against England shortly before Flodden. After the Battle of Binky in 1547, the care of little Queen Mary was of the utmost importance and she was brought to Dumbarton from the island of Inchmahone in Lake Menteith in Perthshire. Nearly two years she remained here, and then, when not yet five years old, she was handed over to Monsieur de Brézé, sent by Henri II to conduct her to France. Fifteen years later she revisited the castle on the royal progress, and even after her dethronement Lord Fleming faithfully held the castle for her. 
It had been her goal when her little army was intercepted and defeated by the Regent Moray at Langside, near Glasgow. The fortress held out until May, 1571, when it was most gallantly captured by a force sent by the Regent, the Earl of Lennox, as is thus detailed by Titler. Captain Crawford of Jordan Hill, to whom was entrusted, had been long attached to the House of Lennox. He was the same person whose evidence was so important regarding the death of Darnley, and who afterwards accused Lethington of participation in the murder, since which time he appears to have followed the profession of arms. In the enterprise he was assisted by Cunningham, commonly called the Laird of Drumwassel, one of the bravest and most skilful officers of his time, and he had been fortunate in securing the assistance of a man named Robertson, who, having once been warden in the castle, knew every step upon the rock familiarly, and for a bribe consented to betray it. With this man, Crawford and his company marched from Glasgow after sunset. He had sent before him a few light horse, who prevented intelligence by stopping all passengers, and arrived about midnight at Dumbuck, within a mile of the castle, where he was joined by Drumwassel and Captain Hume, with a hundred men. Here he explained to the soldiers the hazardous service on which they were to be employed, provided them with ropes and scaling ladders, and advancing with silence and celerity, reached the rock, the summit of which was fortunately involved in a heavy fog, whilst the bottom was clear. But, on the first attempt, all was likely to be lost. The ladders lost their hold while the soldiers were upon them, and had the garrison been on the alert, the noise must inevitably have betrayed them. They listened, however, and all was still dot again their ladders were fixed, and their steel hooks this time catching firmly in the crevices, they gained a small jutting out ledge, where an ash tree had struck its roots, which assisted them as they fixed the ropes to its branches, and thus speedily towed up both the ladders and the rest of their companions. They were still, however, far from their object. They had reached but the middle of the rock, day was breaking, and when, for the second time, they placed their ladders, an extraordinary impediment occurred. One of the soldiers in ascending was seized with a fit, in which he convulsively grasped the steps so firmly, that no one could either pass him, or unloose his hold. But Crawford's presence of mind suggested a ready expedient, he tied him to the ladder, tinned it, and easily ascended with the rest of his men. They were now at the bottom of the wall, where the footing was narrow and precarious, but once more fixing their ladders in the cope's tone, Alexander Ramsay, Crawford's ensign, with two other soldiers, stole up, and though instantly discovered on the summit by the sentinel who gave the alarm, leapt down and slew him, sustaining the attack of three of the guard till he was joined by Crawford and his soldiers. Their weight and struggles to surmount it, now brought down the old wall and afforded an open breach, through which they rushed in, shouting a Darnley, a Darnley. Crawford's watchword, given evidently from affection to his unfortunate master, the late king. The garrison were panic-struck, and did not attempt resistance. Lord Fleming, from long knowledge of the place, was able to make his escape down an almost perpendicular cleft or ravine in the face of the rock, and reached Argyleshire in a fishing boat. Lady Fleming was very courteously treated and eventually allowed to depart with all her plate and furniture. Not so fortunate was Archibald Hamilton, Archbishop of St. Andrews, who was taken to Stirling and cruelly hanged on a tree. Later the castle was used as a state prison. The most important prisoner was the ex-regent Morton, sent here in December, 1580, and removed to Edinburgh a few months later, to be tried and condemned for his knowledge of the murder of Dunley. During the Civil War Dumbarton changed hands three times, and finally was garrisoned by Cromwell in 1652. At present it is a small garrison, and in the armory are a few relics, among them a two-handed sword which belonged to Sir William Wallace. From the Castle and Keeps of Scotland, published in 1907.